Coming up, I'm going to teach you the secret to learning any skill really quickly. And then why men are dropping out of the labor force. This is going to get me fired up. And then the younger generation are sustaining luxury lifestyles. How? Let's go. Helping you win at work and in life. Helping you make more money and experience more meaning. This is the Ken Coleman Show, and I'm glad you're with us. All right, let's get right to it. I love to teach a little bit of a hack, and I'm going to teach it today on how to learn something very, very quickly. I mean, we're always trying to gather new skills. I mean, it is the name of the game. You're competing, and if you don't think you're competing, I got news for you. You are losing. <laughs> yes, I'm old school. I come from the world where you shouldn't get a ribbon for showing up. We should remove all trophies from all Little League sports except for first place. I'm so old school that I would remove second and third place trophies. Well, can they have a gold medal and they have a silver medal and they have a bronze medal? I don't care. Those are for Olympians who work really hard. Kids need to know that there's only one place in life, first place. If you're not in first place, you lost. It doesn't make you a loser. It does not make you a loser. Well, we got to have the first conversation so that we can have the second and more important conversation that failing is not awful. Striving, hustling, competing, and losing isn't bad. I'm letting that sit for a second. Losing feels bad, but it's not bad. And we've got to start handling this. All right, that was a little commercial. I got off on a tangent. Back to my notes. How do you learn anything really quickly? So the norm for learning is education. Education, 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 education. Politicians talk about education all the time. Oh, education, 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 education. All right. I would tell you that your education pales in comparison to your experience. I just want you right now, listening, watching, however you're listening or watching, I want you to try to think of three very specific things that have helped you in your life that came from a textbook or a lecture in high school. I need that Jeopardy music right now. What do you got? I'll bet you no one's got three things. Education is nothing without experience. So we do have to learn, all right? We get out of school, we still need to be lifelong learners. But there's really a step in the middle, and we focus on two things in our Western Hemisphere, which is education and then experience, right? So if you think about a job application, you think about uh, your resume, you think about the interview, we largely, as a society, we think about education and experience. What have you learned? Where'd you learn it? What have you done? That's great. Education experience are great. But when it comes to truly gathering skills, in other words, think of a tool belt with great tools in it so that you can win. There's a there's a third element. And, and the way I described it, I was thinking about this and in, in creating this content last week. And so I'm going to give you a metaphor today of a three-planked bridge. All right? And, and the bridge is going to cover the gap between where you are and where you want to be, all right? Everybody's with me now. So I'm here, and I want to get here, and I'm going to give you what I believe is the most important, that middle plank, and it keeps you from going <laughs> splat. Education, yes, I must learn. Experience, yes, I must do something while I learn. But there's something else in the middle that takes our education to the next level. You ready? Here's the word. I've lost my drum roll sound effect, so I did it with the paper. Observation. Observation. I think it is the most unsung activity 
in the world. And I would submit to you that the most successful women and men in the world all understood the unlimited power of observation. I'm going to walk you through that. Observation. What does it look like in my journey? How do I go from 33 years of age, no broadcasting degree, no broadcasting experience, to stepping into my dream job at the age of 42? And I'm a national broadcaster. And part of my journey was I developed a reputation as a very good interviewer. In other words, conducting conversations that people really liked. I had no experience and I had no education. Hmm. How did I do it? Observation. I watched hundreds and I mean hundreds. No exaggeration here. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of Larry King Live, a show on CNN. It was an interview show. I used just to watch it. And I didn't just watch it. Watch this. I observed. I observed Larry's body language, his interaction, his staccato style. I didn't agree with everything he did. In fact, that's the beauty of observation. What did I like about what Larry did? What did I not like? What would I do differently? I watched Bob Costas, a famed sports broadcaster, deep dive interviews. I watched... Charlie Rose, I watched David Frost's famous interview with Richard Nixon. I've watched it, I'm afraid to admit how many times. Watching David Frost have what is, to this day, one of the most unbelievable conversations with a politician. I watched it. I observed. So you've got to observe, so listen to great speakers, listen to great writers, listen to great directors, watch what they do, observe, and the world is flat in 2022, uh, soon to be 2023, you can get on YouTube and observe anybody doing anything. So here's what I'm looking for. How do they do it? Why do they do it? What motivates them? When you're observing a great craftsman, you ought to be asking questions. Why do you like to make silver? Why do you want to be a blacksmith? Why do you like making furniture? Why do you like being a mechanic? How they do it, why they do it. How'd they get there? Quentin Tarantino is one of my favorite stories of this. He's the oddball director, Pulp Fiction, you know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Kill Bill. You know, I could go down the list. What you may not know about Quentin Tarantino is that when he was uh, a teenager or in his early 20s, he worked at a video store. I don't know if it was a blockbuster, but let's just assume it was something like that. And so after hours, he had access to all the videos in the store, and he literally would just watch them. And he, he said in a story, in an interview, he watched every movie in the blockbuster. And what he did was is he began to realize what kind of movies he liked. And then he went to the next level. Oh, I tend to like this director and this director more. Why do I like them? What do they do in their movies that draws me in? And what Quentin Tarantino did through the power of observation is he began to see who he wanted to be and what he wanted to do. The secret to learning and growing quickly is observation. Observe. You never know what you're going to learn. Coming up next, why men are leaving the workforce and not coming back. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, that's your talent, the work you love to do, that's your passion, and the results that matter to you, your mission. Then you'll feel more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash clarity. the people, by the people, for the people. I am a man of the people. If you're new to the program, thanks for joining us. Uh, how can I say that with uh, such conviction? Because I exist for one purpose here on this show, to help you do what you were born to do. 
You were created to fill a unique role in your work. You were needed. You must do it. Let me say it again, because that may be the most important thing you hear today or all year. You were created to fill a unique role in your work, through your work. That means you're unique. You are needed. That means you're valuable. And you must do it. You have a responsibility to show up and be who you were uniquely created to be. It's not about you. It's about other people. Come on. All right. That's just for the new people who are wondering why I'm so fired up all the time. Well, when you, I'm serious. If you want to know why I'm all the time fired up, go back and just, that's the thing. And I just believe that to everything that I am. And I want to tell as many people as possible that that's true about you. So if you're new to this and I'm a little too juiced up for you, well, you'll get over it. You'll get used to it. It's entertaining sometimes. Here we go. Uh, new study out. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm, I'm really fired up over this. Men are dropping out of the labor force because they're upset about their social status. Jeez. Oh, I got, Alex, I'm going to take my time through this so I don't say something that hurts some snowflake dude out there. This is the headline. I want you to just process what I just said. Men are quitting because they're upset about their status. That's the real headline. Men are dropping out of the labor force because they're upset about their social study, social status. They're quitting because they're losing. Do you want to know what's going on? I just laid it out. They're quitting because they're losing. You know why they're quitting? Because they're losing? Because their mom and dad didn't teach them how to lose. Their mom and dad didn't allow them to lose enough to where they freaking developed some grit. For those of you that have rolled your eyes every time you hear somebody my age, and by the way, don't call me boomer, because I'm not a boomer, I'm an Xer. By the way, I'm not a label. You know what I am? I'm right. When you, for decades, began to categorically and strategically remove losing from children's lives, this is what you get. And I'm right. By the way, you do know that five-year-olds and six-year-olds know what a score is. They know that the other team kicked the ball in there twice and they haven't even gotten close. So why are we playing this silly charade? All right. But folks, I'm telling you, this is a societal problem. Let me give you the data. Non-college educated men have seen their pay shrink by more than 30% since 1980 compared to the average earnings of all other prime age workers. Now this, let me just address this. Some of you are going to go, well, Ken, this flies in the face of what you say, that a college degree is increasingly worthless. No, it doesn't fly in the face of it. It actually validates what I've been saying on this show, which is that the college degree has been marketed to the world as a status symbol. And so the world plays the game. I'm going to pay somebody more because they've got one of these worthless diplomas. That's what I think about your diploma. It's worthless unless you do something with what you learn. But the world, it's all in on the game. The message is, if you go to college and get a degree, you are a better person. And it's garbage. It's total garbage, stinking, hot, nasty garbage. So here's what happens. So the world, we react. It's the game. It's the matrix. We're in the matrix. Non-college-educated men's weekly earnings have declined 17%, while those of college-educated men rose by 20%. This is adjusting for inflation. That earnings loss has caused a decline in their social status, prompting them to walk away entirely. Now, we got two problems. Uh, you've heard me bang on the whole marketing message that college is the only way to success. I'm not going to go down that road today because you know what I think about it. 
But the fact is, is that men are walking away from work altogether. They are so discouraged to the point that they're despondent and they're saying, I'm done. I'm taking my ball. I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. And this is no joke. The study found that the decline in earnings for non-college educated men over the last four decades has increased their likelihood of leaving the labor force by nearly half a percentage point. Nearly 89.7% of men between 35 and 44 were looking for jobs or already working as of November. That's down from 90.9% before the pandemic. So since the pandemic, what we're seeing here is simply this. More men are just going, I'm done. And they're between the ages of 35 and 44. Dudes. Bros. Men. And I never may, I never get into race at all. But, but I, if there's anybody I can go after, I'm going after white men right now because I'm a white guy. So none of you can say anything about it. All right? I'm going to bang on white men right now because I'm white. And I'm going to take all my white privilege and I'm going to aim it at my fellow white privileged brothers. Is everybody cool with that? Great. Because I'm reminding everybody real quick that I'm white. All right. Here's the data. Younger white men in particular were more likely to leave when their expected wages fell relative to their more educated peers. Now, listen, I don't get into all this racial crap and white privilege and all that kind of stuff. I'll say that as an American male, I'm privileged. As an American, I'm privileged. I got no problem with that. That doesn't make me woke. It doesn't make me liberal. So everybody relax. But I will tell you, this data tells me when we've got white men being more likely to leave work all together when their wages fell relative to more educated peers. Or in other words, white guys are going, well, I'm not where I want to be or where I see myself, so I'm just going to go home. That's a problem. What it tells me is, and this is just the facts, folks, is that you have a higher percentage of white people that make more money, and so they're willing and able to help their kids come home and stay in their basement. Unlike men, women have not seen the same level of decline in their wages based on education. That group has seen a 32% increase in weekly earnings. So we got women who are more manly than men. It's a problem. We have a societal problem of men not being men, not standing up and doing something for themselves and for other people. We have a societal crisis, folks. And it's not solved, by the way, through policy. There's no president, there's no political party that can solve this. And I'm telling you, folks, this is a crisis. Alex, I want to cover this other Gen Z story. I'm going to push it to later in the program. So I, I want to rant on this for the... Jeez, I hardly have any time. I want to do the entire show on this. All right, here's what I want to say really quickly. Parents, if you are a parent or a grandparent or a family member or friend who is harboring, and I mean this this way, if you are harboring a weak, wussified man, you got to stop. You got to stop. You got to push them out of the nest. Push them to me. I won't call them a wuss to their face because I actually care about them. But I'm just telling you, parents, grandparents, friends, family members, stop taking care of men who can work but don't want to. Stop it now. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? You're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. If you need to make a move, you'll even get practical next steps to keep you moving forward. Listen, stuck is a choice, and life is too short not to do what you were created to do. To take the quiz, go to kencoleman.com slash quiz.
right, folks, welcome back to the program. All right, so we've got ourselves a uh, another case of bad bossery right here. Oh, oh, oh man. <laughs> Alex, I got to tell you, this is, uh, can I read, should I read the whole letter or some of it? What do you think? Most of it. All right, very good. Here we go. <laughs> so Olive Garden, by the way, can we all just have a moment of silence for the breadsticks? Love the breadsticks. Love the breadsticks. We need to do an episode where I uh, have breadsticks on the desk and just, you know, in between answering the coaching session while I'm getting someone to talk, I'm sneaking a bite. All right. Olive Garden manager fired over an email rant about employees who are calling in sick. All right. So um, a Reddit user posted this email uh, it was a mass email from an Olive Garden manager, and the subject was about employees who apparently repeatedly were calling in with various excuses as to why they were unable to show up for work. So uh, the uh, article here is from uh, Snopes.com. I don't know what that is, but they contacted the parent company, Darden Restaurants. And the spokesperson, Rich Jeffers, did confirm that this letter I'm going to read a portion of is in fact real and then provided this statement. We strive to provide a caring and respectful work environment for our team members. This message is not aligned with our company's values. We can confirm we have parted ways with this manager. Don't you love, don't you love corporate statements? I, I didn't plan to do this, but if I was a corporate spokesman or CEO, I would... I would just give the media real statements. This is what I would say. Uh, that's not how we want our managers to treat our people. And we fired this bonehead. <laughs> that's what I would do. Okay. So uh, let's get to this. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but here we go. Um, our call-offs, I guess that's what they're calling when people are calling saying, I'm not coming in, uh, are occurring. This is from the manager. Our call-offs are occurring at a staggering rate. From now on, if you call off, you might as well go out and look for another job. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Not the way I do it, but I, I, I'm not like, I don't have a big problem with that. It's kind of going, this is ridiculous. All right. But I get it. I think they're just, they're just mad, right? So I get some frustration there. This is where it gets ridiculous. We are no longer tolerating any excuse for calling off. If you're sick, you need to come prove it to us. All right, beyond being ridiculous, I don't want somebody with strep throat coming to me going, ah, you know, what are we doing? And now it gets worse. If your dog died, you need to bring him in and prove it to us. Okay. <laughs> I mean... Really? I, now, this is a manager who is unhinged. If your dog died, you got to bring the dog in. So, by the way, there's no reason to write anything else. When you write something this stupid, everybody's done. Um, if it is a family emergency and you can't say, too bad, go work somewhere else. If you, want, if you only want morning shifts, go work at a bank. If anyone here on out calls out more than once in the next 30 days, you will not have a job. All you said, if you call off, you might as well quit. Now we're changing it. Um, do you know how in 11 and a half years at Darden, how many days I called in? Zero. I came in sick. Well, I don't want you handling the breadsticks when you're sick. It's nuts. It's wacky. It's unbelievable. So anyway, this thing, of course, went bananas. And um, and this is a this is representative of two things. Okay, and I'm just going to break this down quickly. I want to get to this next story. This is a situation where you've got a manager who's stressed out of their mind. All right, um, and they're past the breaking point. You know the old phrase, "hurting people hurt people." Well, this is a person who is doing everything they can. And again, I'm not excusing what they said at all. It's ridiculous. It's awful. But I know that I've said some awful things before when I'm really hurting and I'm really angry and I'm triggered. And that's what's going on. Can't fill the shift. And this is happening over and over and over. And you get to your breaking point. And at that point, there's no logic at all, leaders. 
And you got to be careful of this. So the first thing is let's acknowledge that hurting people do these kinds of desperate, crazy things. It is literally a reaction. You know, it is, um, it is the equivalent of somebody getting bullied. If you've ever seen a video, you know, and somebody's messing with them, messing with them, you get in their face and the person's not doing anything. You can see they're holding in. And just when you start to feel bad for the person's getting bullied, what do they do? They snap. Boom. And they respond. And that's what this manager did. The manager's like, I had it. And you say things like, if your dog died, you got to bring the dog in with you. And now it's over. Now there's no point of return. It's just, it's it. And you lose your job. So that's the first thing. Second thing, leaders. I hold not just the manager responsible, but that manager's got a leader. And I'm going to tell you something, and I, I'm railing on this stuff. There is a leadership structure above that manager that it did not do it, and it's not your fault. I want to be very clear about what I'm saying. Whoever leads that Olive Garden manager, it's not your fault that that manager wrote those crazy things. But it is your responsibility. And you knew that that manager and probably other managers were fighting hard to just get a shift in to be able to open the restaurant so that they could pay their bills, pay for their kids. Come on, leaders. You know this is going on. You should have been engaged with that manager and never let that manager get to a breaking point. You should have rolled your sleeves up and got in there and helped out. That's where this breaks down. And what I would have liked to have seen in the statement from Olive Garden is the leadership, and I'd love the CEO to, what I would have preferred is that a Darden restaurant CEO said, I want to, I want to address this. This is uncalled for and unacceptable, and we've terminated the employee. However... As the CEO of Darden Restaurants, I take full responsibility for this situation. Our leadership team and our hierarchy has failed this manager and thus failed our employees. It is my responsibility to make sure that a manager never is feeling this level of stress and that people are not calling in all the time and not coming in. It is my responsibility to create an environment where this never happens. That's what it should be. All right. Now, this from Business Insider. So they're, what they're doing is, is that they are um, they're writing a hit piece on Elon Musk at Twitter, and, and he's all over the news. And, and you know, let, let me just say this about Elon Musk, because they, they, this story actually covers something good that he did. And I'm going to say this. I think he's a – I think the guy is uh, brilliant, but I think the guy has no idea how to lead effectively. And he's got a track record of a lot of bad employee stuff. And, you know, he's just all over the place. But this story highlights one thing he said recently, which I think is good. So, again, uh, this is good Elon. All right? I've talked about bad Elon. This is good Elon. An email sent just before Thanksgiving from Musk, he told employees that all managers are expected to write a meaningful amount of software themselves. And went on to basically say that, their ability or their inability to code as an engineering manager is the same as not being able to ride a horse as a cavalry captain. And he's right. It's like leading a cavalry and going, well, I don't actually ride a horse. I'm, I'm in the wagon. I'm in the wagon and everybody else rides in line behind us. It's nonsensical. Um, he went on to say that um, Managers need to be able to do the same work of those that they are leading and not just say, well, I did it in the past. I haven't done it in a while. I'm a little rusty. No, they need to be able to do it and step in and do it effectively. I think that's right. And one of the one of the chasms of the great divides in today's workplace comes from leaders, managers, who really don't know how to do what it is that they're leading people to do. And they need to have an understanding of this. So... Really good stuff. Good Elon there. So there you go. Hey, there's hope. You can be a better leader. I promise. Don't move. More show coming up. If the thought of attending a networking event makes you break out in hives... 
you're not alone. And I'll let you in on a secret. Networking in the traditional sense doesn't work, but genuine connection is all about relationships. That's why we created Networking the Right Way. This free guide is the low pressure, high impact way to overcome the awkwardness, build real relationships, and turn your connections into opportunities. To get the guide, go to kencoleman.com slash network. All right, folks, hope you're doing well today. It's about time to get to our coaching segment. You can jump in at any time, 844-747-2577, 844-747-2577. Let's go to Alex in Cape Coral, Florida. Alex, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Um, thank you for having me on here. I just wanted to give you an update on some of the things I did. Okay. I called you a few weeks ago. Oh, good. In regards to um, you know, talking about my work with just killing me and it was affecting some of my decisions and my motivation. And, um, I took immediate action, um, from what you told me, which was to, to distance myself. And I had the difficult conversation with my family about, um, not only my work life balance, but like what I really wanted to do in my life as opposed to just service to them. And, the initial reaction was that they catastrophized and they got upset, but you know, an incredible thing happened and I got to say, it's got to be the God thing because you know, all of a sudden they started talking about an exit plan, a way to get me to step out of my role and to start pursuing my own interests. Yeah. And yes, at first it was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. There was some yelling and some emotion in it, but I found that it was so helpful to just say what had to be said. Yes. Because after I did it, you know, it, it was already done. It was out there and things started happening from that. So, you know, I took your get clear assessment and I really started looking back on some of the things that I have always enjoyed doing. Yeah. And the purpose statement, you know, that I was given was I was created to use my talents of imagination, logic, and inspection to perform my passions, in promoting, analyzing, researching hmm. to accomplish my mission of influence. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could tell me um, how could I, best put those skills, that passion into something tangible. Yeah. Well, so the talents were imagination, inspection, and logic. Yeah. So that tells me right there that you're a, um, you're a very creative analyzer. That, those would be real life words. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Is that true? That's absolutely true. Yeah. See, you got some people that are, uh, if, if they were to score high on um, logic and inspection, and they're just like, get me in the weeds, leave me alone. But with imagination, it feels like you're a guy who imagines a better future. You're always looking towards a better future. And as a result of that, you imagine solutions and then you go, is that possible? How is it possible? Where is it possible? And that's where the logic and inspection comes in. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. I always have been the kind of person. And that's why I've, I work for my family's real estate development company. Yeah. I um, I always thought about what can be. Yep. Not what is that's already it. there. That's it. And then you go dive in. So you're allowing imagine you're you're just naturally an imaginative guy. Okay, so let's move forward quickly. What also stuck out to me in your assessment results, he's talking about his get clear assessment. You can get it at kencoleman.com. It's it's the most amazing self-awareness tool on the planet. And yes, I created it, but it works. Uh, your missional result, which by the way, folks, if you're new to the assessment idea, your missional result means what motivates you. And the fact that you scored high on influence tells me you want to do people work, work that helps people change their lives. Is that true? Absolutely. 
All right. For the better. And then the passion is work you love. Those were promoting. What were the other two? Analyzing and researching. Yeah. So it's again, the analyzing and researching match up with the logic and inspection. Do you see that? Yes. So I think you're a guy who wants to be diving into solutions to help change people's lives for the better. I just leave it simply at that. So how does that sound to you? That sounds absolutely on point. All and right. Now, now it's just a function of I'm going to go out and do research, and you're good at it, and you like it. <laughs> and let's just research jobs that allow you to be analytical, imaginative, logical, to come up with a solution to a problem that you connect to deeply. That's your next exercise. Who are the people you most want to help, the problem you want to solve, and the solution to that problem? And there comes the job ideas. Thanks for the call, pal. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. If you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is the time to showcase how you are the best choice for the role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just some intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. Go to KenColeman.com slash interview. All right, folks, uh, I've got one simple request for you, and it means a lot to me. If this show is helping you in any way or entertaining you in any way, um, the number one way that a show grows, and I'm never good at asking, is you giving us a good review uh, and liking, subscribing, sharing. So whether that's podcast, YouTube, um, you are the number one influencer in my life. You are. No marketing message matters as much as you saying this is a good show. So a positive review, a like, a subscribe, and a share. Um, that would be great. So please do that for us. We would be forever grateful. And uh, thank you. We do the show for you. Appreciate you so very much. Mason is up next in Atlanta, Georgia. Mason, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. What's going on, Ken? How are you doing? Man, I am living the dream, and you are what's going on. Like, you're the only <laughs> thing going on in my life right now. Isn't that fantastic? Yes, I be here. Well, yes, it is. Um, so I was just talking to Amanda and, um, I left the, well, I left the voice this morning, but I'm, um, I'm kind of struggling because I'm about, I'm about to turn 30, right? I just bought a house and I just cannot stand my boss. Yeah. Um, but what I'm getting at is, um, I'm looking to start my own business, but I'm just kind of scared to jump shit because I'm doing very well where I'm at. Yeah, what kind of business? And so it's a, a produce brokerage. Now, how does that work? Explain that to me in 30 so, seconds like I'm a village idiot. So basically, um, I buy and sell and ship produce, so I'll buy it from you, sell it to my customer in Florida, and then ship it to them. Okay. I do all of it myself, buy and selling, logistics, okay. everything. What kind of margin do you make? Do you, is there kind of a general um, percentage? I can make I can make any any amount of margin that I want to a degree. I mean, as long as a customer will pay for it. Well, I, but I, I you kinda, know that's not true. Yeah. What, what's a general margin? Like, you know, so if you're buying the fruit from me, what are you marking it up? So if I'm buying it from you for $5, let's say it costs me $5 to freight it, um, I'm probably going to put, you know, 2 bucks on there on the top of it. Okay. Yeah. So about two bucks a box, I'd say, and I'm, I mean, we're doing, we're doing a good bit. And you've done it. It sounds like you're doing it on the side. Oh, yeah. yeah. What kind of money have you made? How long have you been doing it and what are you making on average? Per so month? I've, I've been doing it for roughly four years now. When I started, I was just getting paid the very bare minimum, which was 35 grand a year. I could barely afford it. Living only, literally wasn't paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that was four years ago, but this I'm on year four, and I made close to two hundred and seventy grand last year. You made two hundred seventy grand on your side business. It's not my side. This is my main gig. This oh, is, this I'm is my confused. Main gig. Yeah, okay, yeah. my uh, my sorry. fault. So I asked you what yeah. business you wanted to start. 
Yeah, so that's a produce burger, and that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, I'm, so you I'm just want to do right it for now. yourself? Yeah, I just want to do it for myself. Okay, exactly. I'm sorry, Mace. You yeah. see, you see where I got confused though. Yeah, yeah. Because no, you told I'm me that's what that. you want to do, and then I'm like, you told me you made two hundred thousand. I'm like, uh, tell the boss to pound sand as soon as the phone call. In fact, let's get him on the phone now. I'll fire <laughs> yeah, him. No. I was like, hey, by the way, Mason's quitting. I'm his friend, Ken. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the answer, the the high level answer is, you should be afraid. Yeah. Because you're making two hundred grand. Yeah. And you've yet to do this on your own for yourself. However, 100%. you have done it. And if you've got the connections, you have to ask yourself, what must be true for me to get some clients and then build up the clientele to where I could do this for myself? Because right now you're benefiting from the fact that somebody's gone out there and done all that for you. Yeah, to a degree. Um, or did sure. you do I mean, it? I've also... So, I mean, half the, I'd probably say about 70% of my business, um, is customers. I had to gain their trust. I had to, I had to get them on board. Um, cause we didn't have, I, I buy everything out of Mexico. So it's all Texas, um, stuff, Okay, but it's all coming out of Texas. So that's my region. Um, and so what I ended up doing is I just kind of grew the business from around 80 grand in profit to about 800,000. And, um, wow, good I'm you. just kind of. And, and it's and my it, me and my boss. It's it's not. He's not the worst. I mean, he's, well, well, what's going he's on? Just in a, what's going on? He's he's just he just he lo he loves to work, man. I mean, he's he just he that's all he thinks about, and um, I think that's kind of where he wants me to be. And I'm like, and I do. I literally I work every single day, whether I'm on vacation, no matter what. I mean, it's my business. I created it. I'm the only one that's going to take care of it. You know what I well, mean? Well, wait a second. It's not your business, but uh, you're taking extreme ownership, which I love. Yeah. Yeah, but and, and so, so who's making is, is, what needs to change? I want to focus on this because my answer on the other thing when you go out on your own is a little bit easier and formulaic. But I really want to yeah. see if we can resurrect this deal because you started off by going, I can't stand my boss. And now you're going, he's really not a bad guy. And it feels like you're just overworked. I, th I mean, it's, I think I've thought about it and I wish that I could just have like one day to where I could like work remote, you know? Well, wait a second. Are be... you working six or seven days a week? Oh yeah. I mean, I work every single day. But yeah. is he, and, I mean, but is he making you do that or do you do that because you love it so much and you just can't pull yourself away? Cause I have to, cause if no one else will do it, then I, I'm a hundred percent commission. Oh. And if no one else does it, then I'll lose that business. You know what I mean? Well, no, well, yes and no. I, got, I have. You no mean you can't me tell out. your? I get it, but can't you tell your client, "Hey, listen, I'm the only person doing this, and I know you're happy with what I get you, um, but it'll be Monday before I can process that." But you're just going, "Well, I got to process it on Saturday, and I got to do this on Sunday, and if I don't do yeah, it, I just don't. I just don't want them ever going to someone else." Yeah, but that's relationships. You know, All right, so two, yeah, no, I agree. Two I agree. things need to happen. If you walk today, your boss would be screwed, wouldn't he? It would be tough for him to recover, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, it would, it so would, have you had a conversation a with your boss to go, hey, man, I can't keep doing six and seven days a week? Yeah, right now I'm in the process of trying to get an assistant. Um, what did he say when you said, I can't keep doing six and seven days a week? He, I, I haven't gone to him. Yeah, see, that's yet. the problem. Uh, you have to sit down with him and go, hey, I love what I'm doing. I'm making really good money. And I want to keep doing it because if I know if I'm making good money, you're making more money. Isn't that true? Yeah, no, he's yeah, he's doing well. He's loving you. So yeah, he just doesn't act like it. That's the thing. Well, but like, that's his problem. Value, you know what I, I mean? get it. But do you want to keep making this money doing this work? Because he pretty much leaves you alone, it sounds like it. Yeah, I mean, he does to a degree. All right, so here's just, the deal. Yeah. Either you sit down and be a big boy with him and say, hey, man, look, yeah. I can't keep doing this. So will so will you help me figure out a way to where I can do this five days a week and have a life and still keep making more money for you and for me? What's yeah, his that's response? That's kind of where we're at. Well, but you haven't, haven't had that I conversation. I haven't said that exact to him, but I'm getting very you close. You have to say it exactly yeah. to go, hey, man, I'm crushing it. I want to keep crushing it, but I can't keep doing six and seven days a week. I'm going to burn out. Yeah. From that's, overwork. That's the, the burnout's like, it's real. I know it's that's real. And it's overwork. Yeah. One of the five causes of burnout, as I identify it, is being overworked. You're overworked. Yeah, I'm losing my damn mind. I know you head. are. I know you are. And he can help you with that. 
you know. Now, will he choose to help you with that? We don't know, but we got to at least explore it. Now, yeah, if he just stays kinda, out of the I'm way, start that conversation. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, look, if he goes, look, I'm not gonna. But can he get some money to hire you an assistant to take off a and, lot of stuff? And I think that's what he's starting to work on now. I mean, he just got kind of thrusted in this position, and it's well, then, dude, listen. Let me just tell plate. you this. All right, um, let me summarize this whole call. Yeah. Yeah. You have got to have an adult conversation and come with a solution. If we hire an assistant for 20 hours or 40 hours, this is what they would do. This is what I would offload to them, and it would allow me to do more of this, which makes more money for you and for me, and I don't have to do it seven days a week, and I have a life. 100%. That's the conversation. Show him a solution, not just go to it with a problem. It sounds like you're already doing that. Now, to the issue of working for yourself. You keep busting it and making really good money and save up enough money to where you got six months at a minimum of your current income. And then don't steal his clients. Don't steal the company's clients. But you can go out on your own when you've got six to 12 months of your income in the bank so that you're not stressed. And then I believe yeah. in you that you could build your business up in six to 12 months. So whenever you've got that number in the bank, I would say if this is what you want to do, go do it on your own. But don't steal clients. I'm never going to be a fan of that. But, Mason, I think this can get better quickly, and you make even more money, which fast forwards your dream of working for yourself. But you've got to have a conversation with the boss. Hey, you matter. You have what it takes. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.